I'm here with the Director of the Environmental Change and Security Program at the Wilson Center, Dr. Jeff DeBelko, who's at the UCI campus to speak in our Perspectives on Sustainability seminar series. Jeff, one of the, one of the, one of the questions that we've been asking speakers over the course of the year is, is most people have heard the definition of sustainability that comes from the Bretland Report. Mm -hmm. That's the dominant definition. Is it still the best definition? Is it still the best way to communicate this to people? Mm -hmm. to, to, is it the definition that we want the next generation mm -hmm. to be employed? Mm -hmm. I think we, we have to start with Bretland. We have to start with the notion that we're trying to, trying to develop in ways that meet current generation's needs without prohibiting from meeting future generations needs. But I think we have to burrow down on that in a couple ways. One, we have to look at sustainability at different levels. So it's at personal level, household level, community level, up to a national and international context. So it really has to be something that can operate on, on different levels. Second, of course, what has fallen out of fashion is the notion of development and development as uh, consuming more as progress. And so in that sense, uh, by dropping development, focusing on sustainability, I think it does lead us to, uh, to spend more time thinking about um, exactly how we can meet those needs in ways that don't define the good life as more is better. And so in that respect, it should then come into our design elements, it should come into our behavioral decisions in terms of what we eat, where we live, how we move around, where we work. And so that's it. it has to permeate our considerations as a process rather than some magical end of some sustainable nirvana uh, that we might um, engineer at some later date. But it's a, it's a process of internalizing uh, a, a kind of critical thinking throughout our, throughout our entire lives and our societies and our countries. As a process, and, 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 and with the goal of making progress um, in this regard. Here in California, people have, are sort of undecided in terms of how to set priorities. Mm -hmm. We know that climate change is important, but we also know that the, that the health of the oceans is very important in mm -hmm. California. Um, water issues are big, mm -hmm. related to climate change or other, or, or other issues. Um, the protection of our, of our forest cover and so on, the future of farming. These are all important environmental issues, all areas in which the, the question of sustainability is big. Is there a way for people, do you have a sense of what the, what the priorities for the next few years, the next two, three, four mm -hmm. years, ought to be for, for the US or, or even uh, more grandly for the world? Mm -hmm. Well, this may be a dodge, but I guess I would say that the first thing we need to do is, is better understand our place in the world in a sustainability context. And by we, I mean the US and developed countries. And part of that is getting out and understanding how tremendous innovation, tremendous energy, tremendous ability to harness technology in pursuit of sustainability, but at the same time, just grossly wasteful and, and consuming so much more uh, than we need to. And so on some level, it seems that a top priority is finding a way to redefine the good life away from more is better um, and finding, uh, finding uh, fulfillment in, in ways that are compatible with sustainability. And so if one were to adopt that kind of frame, then on the whole host of important issues that you, that you list in a variety of different environmental areas and energy areas, uh, but really kind of permeates all sectors of, uh, of life, then I think we can um, really start making some progress. And in some ways, then through that, we will see priorities based on opportunity for improvement. Efficiency gains are doing things differently. There might be a priority list there. I think um, certainly, as you know, I've spent a lot of time on water, and I think it's a neglected issue, uh, yet absolutely critical issue. So I think from uh, current and certainly where we're going in terms of scarcity and availability, uh, and really some challenging institutional management mechanisms around there, around the pricing and how we really don't capture the full cost of that, that it suggests that some of those issues will come up because of where we are in terms of our consumption of them. But I think it starts with our, our really stepping back and understanding that um, some of our models of, of uh, 
models of efficiency, ways that we set priority, have to be fundamentally questioned in terms of how we're how we're defining defining a good life. I mean, I, I think that that in state politics, national politics, it's and, and and throughout the history of the environmental movement, it's been easy to set immediate local priorities. <clears throat> Here, you know, we have a year where the fires are bad. Fire prevention, fire management becomes a priority. We have a year in which there are heat waves. All of a sudden, you know, how do how do we deal with heat waves becomes a priority. That doesn't necessarily things that are in the headlines and manageable politically are not always mm -hmm. moving us forward. What you're talking about is sort of the sort of things that people like Bill McDonough and Bill McKibben talk about, really rethinking what we want to do. Mm -hmm. What are the in the U.S. are the big obstacles mm -hmm. to move more quickly along that pathway? Well, unfortunately, of course, there are a lot of big obstacles, um, and uh, problem identification is, is uh, far easier than, than, than addressing it. But um, I, I think one of the biggest impediments is the rigidity and uh, inflexibility of our political institutions. Um, they're a hyper-focus on the short term, uh, and some of that is politics and what can get done, but it's also bigger than that in terms of the time frames. That, they could still adopt a long-term time frame, even if it was difficult to achieve some of what they could recognize as important. But you worry that even that long-term analysis or that integrated analysis is not even being done and kind of being given up on because of perceived short-term and, and um, rather parochial, how strong parochial interests can affect the institution. So I think the biggest uh, challenge is the political. Um, I think there's a, in that a larger Kind of societal um, conservatism is not the right word, but a kind of a fear of change and and and, and finding ways that in order that, that sustainability is not a penalty or not agreeing to something less, but it's a different way of doing things that uh, take into account a larger set of considerations and that um, recognizing these limits or recognizing different ways to do something. Uh, shouldn't be perceived as threatening or um, or, or giving up um, giving up something. So, in that sense, I think there are real barriers around behavioral change, and then real barriers in the political context that our institutions are rigid, and we have uh, in the main leaders who want to follow rather than lead. It seems to me that these two things are are very closely interwoven in the U.S. And it's sort of ironic that, that one of the things that comes with being the richest, most powerful nation is a fair amount of contentment with the status quo. If you're in many other countries, you want change. If you're in China, you're not content with the status quo. You want change. Does that mean that for other countries in the U.S. it's sort of easier because they, they, they want change to plot it in a way which makes sense environmentally, mm -hmm. to sort of develop a 50-year plan for where they would like to be, whereas for us, we, we are where we'd like to be in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think so. I, I think you have a, you've identified, I think, a couple things that with that comparison, China and the US are different. One, certainly form of government, um, and that, uh, that centralized planning, a larger vision that has a uh, everyone pulling, everyone in the eyes of the government, pulling towards some of the same goals, i.e. economic growth, um, that doesn't feel threatened in many respects to uh, recognize the environmental impediments to reaching that goal and some of, therefore, in some ways a very rational economic model for how Efficiency gains just make sense, so why not capture them? And, and there's not quite the, the dynamism of the different stakeholders who might see it differently or winners and losers. Um, but I do think that notion of uh, we've arrived, why would we want to go back perception um, is a strong one. Um, of course, that's for a segment of society in the United States and uh, in the developed world. There are certainly um, coming from southeast Ohio, foothills and Appalachia, there's plenty of people in this country who are not living that good life. Right. Uh, they're not terribly well uh, uh, in power endowed. Um, but so in that sense, it's a diversity within the country that, that provides a challenge as well in terms of 
who, who who's there and who's not. Um, but I do think it comes back to this notion of finding uh, ways that sustainability cannot be um, dismissed as either step backwards or that it's framed in such moral terms that if you are um, if you are somehow failing on that, you're, 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 you should feel bad about it and, and, and such. That it has to be a, uh, the opposite has to be a sense of empowerment that comes from it rather than, than penalty. Um, and, and so in that respect, it is a, a whole host of challenge on multiple levels. Um, part, of, part of the strength of having a participatory democracy means that we have voice and can hold public institutions to account in ways that a regime like China is much more difficult and can, in fact, get you locked up. Um, and so there are many ways that that public process, while much messier, has meant that we've made real progress in addressing some of these issues. I think the challenge is to get past the easy and the obvious, the end of the tailpipe or um, issues to the more diffuse ones that really go at some of this logic of more is better um, and, and bigger is better uh, that is uh, so strongly held here in the United States. I think there's, a, there's been a number of polls over the past decade suggesting Americans are, are not completely content with the leadership in the business sector, in the government sector, and so on in this country. Um, we expect these people to be sort of visionary and willing to take on new challenges and willing to understand how to operate under conditions of uncertainty and risk. But on the environmental front, it seems that they recoil from all of those things. Mm -hmm. Is this uh, ultimately a leadership problem? Well, I think it is a leadership problem. Uh, whether that's the ultimate problem or not, it certainly is part of the problem. Um, I think that it is perhaps uh, the dominant paradigm that at least some of those leaders hold that it is a it's a fine to be avoided it is a penalty to to pass off on somebody else and so in that sense it's meant to keep at arm's length because it's viewed as interference with the business model or interference with um, efficient running of a public institution instead of viewed as opportunity and, um, and viewed as a means to a, a more efficient end or a wealthier end or um, in, in that sense. And not to pretend that there are trade-offs, very real trade-offs, um, and not to pretend that there aren't um, important roles for uh, regulatory and statutory efforts to control behavior that is, uh, is deemed as a larger negative from, from the perspective of, of those doing the regulating. Um, but nevertheless, it is one where I, I think it's a combination of education, it's a combination of harnessing the technological optimism that we have in ways that um, push towards, but integrate the notion of sustainability and, and bring in the notion that there are limits and that there are trade-offs for not respecting those limits uh, that are increasingly going to come to bear on um, a broader context or specific, specific bottom lines. And this sort of leads to, a, to another question. I think that, in my experience, the experience of, of many of my colleagues, today's college student, today's high school student, mm -hmm. today's primary and middle, middle school student have internalized the sense that we are facing in environmental challenges mm -hmm. and climate change. Mm -hmm. They, they, they're not questioning this, they understand this. They also know that part of the solution lies in the choices they make as consumers and so on. Mm -hmm. And so they, they understand that. What they're not sure about is what skills do they need? What should they be doing to position themselves for, for a larger impact, to move into leadership positions, mm -hmm. to move into those jobs in the green economy mm -hmm. that may not yet be created? What, should, what do they need to bring in to the, into the world after they graduate? Mm -hmm. What are people looking for? Well, how do they become agents of change on this, right. on this front? Right. Well, I, I guess uh, at the heart, I would say, one of the ways that they can best set themselves up to make that difference um, is to develop fluency across not just languages, although languages would be important, but across disciplines, 
across sectors, uh, geographic. So we need to get out from behind, out of the library and nose in the books, out into the workplace. And so experiential learning at multiple levels and multiple settings. Get out of the country. Um, we're, we're woefully inadequate as a country in terms of how many students we send abroad. Um, and frankly, the more international students that could come here that we could learn from, the better. Um, and, and in that sense, uh, view your education as a participatory process, one that you want to be in some way, you want to get out of your comfort zone, whether that's a disciplinary comfort zone, a language comfort zone, a geographic one, um, because that greater fluency will serve you well if it's trying to grapple with these problems that have both natural and physical science components to it, as well as the social science and the social behavioral side. Um, and we need people who are fluent in those different languages. Those who are can effectively work in those different worlds. They're, they're incredibly important bridge builders. They can translate the, the research into a practical policy realm, see where it applies, and, and, and find real opportunities there. And so our students today need to, to be fluent and then to be able to communicate it. And by that, I don't only just be sitting down and speaking about it, um, I, I, we find at the Wilson Center where we routinely have uh, many, many interns and staff that um, those who succeed and those who we are most interested in are the ones who can write and communicate the knowledge that they have across these different areas. So we do, if there's one thing I would say to a prospective uh, person who wants to get into this field, is write, 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 and try to publish, 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 no matter where it is, to give yourself that um, experience in expressing ideas, pulling things together, and doing that in a coherent and clear, accessible fashion, uh, because your ideas will be taken much more seriously, and you'll have much greater reach through the ability to communicate that. I think the days of having scientists over here and, and practitioners over there and the scientist hands the book over and expects the practitioner to know what the lessons are, or the practitioner just to somehow um, think that they, by reading the newspaper, understand what's new in research. I mean, that was never the case, but that fiction hopefully is falling away. And part of the way to get to that is, is fluency and the ability to, to express it. One last question. I think that in, 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 you know, in terms of, of sort of symbolism and a sort of potential, potential catalyzing moment, 2012 for America in terms of electoral politics, in terms of the 25th anniversary of, of, of the Brundtland Commission report, in terms of the, the, the hopes that maybe there'll be a breakthrough at a COP. Um, a lot of people are looking ahead and, and, and thinking, what can we achieve in the next two years? Mm -hmm. From your position, do you see sort of things, and I know everybody's crystal ball is roughly the same, but do, are you sort of optimistic that things are starting to move in a trajectory where maybe in a couple of years we really will have another sort of breakthrough moment? Or, or do you think that, that, that it's going to be a big celebration in terms of, of conferences and talks and stuff, but there won't really be mm -hmm. something akin to what we did in, in, in Rio? Are the expectations that are starting to filter up yeah. realistic? Well, I, I worry that we had those expectations for Copenhagen in, in, in <laughs> 2009, and they were, um, they were not met. Um, and I think that should suggest to us a couple things. One, that we should not invest so much hope in singular negotiations and singular events. And um, in that sense, the... Conference of Parties for Climate Change is just one slice, a big slice, an important slice, perhaps right. the most important slice, but one slice of the environmental and the sustainability puzzle. Right. And so we can't uh, let it obscure other efforts. We can't also, in that realm, allow ourselves again to define success so narrowly with a uh, binding targets and timetables is the only measure of success. And so when that's not made, um, then it's deemed a wider failure. And I think that goes to the different levels question in terms of all the action not being in the public sector, that the private sector is critically important, obviously. Uh, and second, it's not all at the federal or national level, that there's so much innovation. I mean, I think, for example, 
the United States made a mistake by not going and really touting the local and state level innovations in energy and climate. Right. Um, and allowed to, and kind of accepted in part because they came into it midstream with the kind of first year administration and such, but uh, allowed for that narrow definition of success to be accepted that the Europeans and, and G77 define. And so part of, part of how we should meet rising expectations is in part to diversify those expectations into other areas so that we can see successes in some and still be frustrated and have to make progress in others. Um, right. And in that sense, try to then learn from, learn from them and not hold up all progress because the narrow definition, um, um, an indicator of success was not achieved. I mean, I think, and at the same time, anniversaries are, are politically valuable as sort of mobilizing events, education moments, times to, to take stock of what's happened and, and sort of um, uh, develop a new set of goals. So we don't want to lose the, uh, we don't want to put too much in it, but we also don't want to lose the opportunity of media attention and, and, and things connecting different parts of the planet around mm -hmm. 2012 and around the idea that let's take stock. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that, that, that's the dilemma is that expectations which are going to be dashed versus using these moments to catalyze a whole lot of interest and activity. Yeah, I think, however, I think that this may be more challenging in 2012 in part because of this 2009 experience mm -hmm. that, there, that it was seen as a unorganized disaster that had to be kind of pulled together at the last minute through intervention of heads of state. That it was, that, that even to the point of accrediting 35,000 people for a facility that holds less than 20,000. I mean, just going to be right. basic math <laughs> would suggest that that's going to be a challenge. And so the, the difficulty of having voice by physically being in the building or being excluded from the building, as well as then the, the real breakdown uh, of the process, uh, I, I worry that there will be among senior level politicians a very dim view towards the mega conference as a way to get things done. Um, right. Would like to be wrong, and maybe that'll be assigned to climate as opposed to a broader environmental agenda. But as much as too much now is already having climate be the stand in for environment and obscuring all other environmental sets of questions and negotiations, I, I, I fear that 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 will be the case um, and, and present a real additional challenge. The other is, frankly, I was appalled at how poor the press coverage was of the Copenhagen negotiations, given how important I thought um, the topics that were being addressed were, um, that it is like a larger, you know, certainly part of a larger context of poor international coverage of international issues, poor coverage of scientific issues. I mean, CNN fired its entire science and environment uh, team, which was unbelievably only eight or nine people um, late last oh. year, um, and uh, or the year before. And you know, when talking to, the, to one of the senior people in that position, the, the notion was, you know, this wasn't what CNN needed to be fighting with, uh, off their competitors in the cable news network. The science environment wasn't a priority, so that division was expendable. Um, and you know, so in that sense, anniversaries are terrific. But if no one's no one's <laughs> covering it, covers then, um, then it sure. kind of ha happens in, in in obscurity. And hopefully, that will not happen in Cancun in December of 2010 around climate, and and in Rio in 2012, the, the Earth yeah. Summit anniversary. But uh, I, I worry that. Uh, opportunities to share the insights and have that educational um, and, and inspiration uh, that can come from that uh, will be shared with, with precious, precious few. Over the course of the past several months, um, speakers have, have, have sort of shared their own personal sense of, of whether ultimately they're fairly optimistic and or, or whether they're fairly pessimistic and I think the, the the sort of the most common position is optimistic but we don't have very much time and I'm close to moving into pessimism mm -hmm. do you have a 
Yeah, I, well, you want I, to that, show your views? Yeah, yeah. I, I think uh, cautiously optimistic. Otherwise, why do we engage in this <laughs> profession and engage on these issues? Um, but that it, the problems are very severe, and that recognition is not there in a wider context. And that I think even more troubling than the lack of recognition, the uh, repeated example of political institutions being unable to deal with really big and complex issues that are long-term, diffuse, includes uncertainty, and uh, requires real change and, and real money um, uh, to, to make it happen. Um, that our political institutions are not up to up to that in in ways that they need to be, particularly given the rate of change. I think that to me is what strikes me as probably has always been the case, but I and I think the field are certainly more aware of the sense, and we get that particularly in climate change, the kind of right, notion right. of acceleration of history, acceleration of this change <laughs> that is is uh, is challenging. Uh, us in ways that we're, we're not well prepared to deal with. I mean, it's funny how the, the environmental movement is always sort of, sort of careening between optimism and things are getting better and then pessimism actually, mm -hmm. the science is, 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 is shortening our time horizon and mm -hmm. optimism, we've just had this, so it's this sort of, it is a roller coaster mm -hmm. of a ride. Mm -hmm. um, always good to have you visit the University of California at Irvine, Jeff, thanks very much. Pleasure, thank you. Thank you.